So I'm sure everyone is familiar with the infamous North Hollywood shootout. It was a pretty big deal. They made a really shitty movie about it. Aim for the head! But what a lot of people don't understand is that incident wasn't even the worst of the worst. There's actually a robbery that occurred 17 years prior to that incident that makes the North Hollywood shootout look pretty fucking mild. The incident occurred on May 9th, 1980. You got five dumbasses, otherwise known as suspects, George Smith, Chris Harvin, Russell Harvin, Manny Delgado, and not pictured because there are zero photos of him alive, Belisario Delgado. The plan was pretty simple. Stage two getaway vehicles at the north end of the city filled with camping gear, sniper rifles, and ammo. Set off an IED at a gas main at the south end of the city to create some sort of diversion while they rob the bank during the explosion and drive a stolen van to the getaway vehicles. Go camp in Big Bear, make some s'mores, till they lose that five star wanted level. Manny Delgado, Belisario Delgado, and Russell Harvin stole a van from a mall in Orange County, kidnapping the driver in the process. The suspects then drove the van to the city of Corona while communicating with their high-tech walkie-talkies. They then set the bomb, lit the fuse, and drove to the bank. But the bomb never went kaboom, and these idiots were standing in a busy bank parking lot at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, looking like G.I. Joes with their rifles, camouflage, and ski masks, and decided, you know what? Fuck it, we came this far. Leroy Jenkins, at which point a teller from a bank across the street picked up the phone and called the Riverside County Sheriff's Office very concerned. A teller from inside the bank being robbed also pressed a panic alarm. However, the alarm notification was sent to the Corona Police Department and Corona PD responded to a different branch five miles away. But the agencies figured it out and dispatched the proper units. Riverside's Narco units have a 211 in progress at the Security Pacific Bank, 4th and Hamner. Deputy Belaski was first on scene. He was literally in the area when the call dropped, but didn't realize a robbery was in progress. This is why we have computers. As Deputy Belaski casually arrived on scene, to his surprise, the gunman opened fire on his patrol car, sending Belaski in reverse toward oncoming traffic where he collided with another vehicle and was able to quickly get out of his patrol coffin and take cover. As the robbers made a run for it, Belaski returned fire using a 12-gauge shotgun, striking the driver, Belisario Delgado, instantly killing him, sending the van crashing into a telephone pole guy wire. <gasps> the four remaining robbers then exited the vehicle and fired over 200 rounds at Belaski, putting 47 bullet holes in his cruiser, five of which struck Deputy Belaski. A second unit arrived on scene and Deputy Chuck Hill was able to drag Belaski out of harm's way while attempting to rush him to a nearby hospital. Meanwhile, the suspects began to panic, their friend just got smoked, their van just got smoked, and now the police have them surrounded in the middle of the street. And now you're probably thinking that the story's coming to an end. This is 1980. There are no patrol rifles. The police are completely outgunned. The suspects have the upper hand and significantly superior firepower. I mean, these dudes could shoot down a helicopter if they really wanted to. That happens later. The suspects end up commandeering a pickup truck that was stopped at an intersection. They collected all their hand grenades, guns, ammunition, and stolen loot from the van and jumped in the truck. Chris Harvin jumps in the driver's seat. Manny Delgado gets in the passenger seat, armed with an HK-93 and crying because his brother just got smoked. George Smith, armed with an HK-91, and Russell Harvin, armed with a short stock AR-15, get in the bed of the truck and start throwing rounds at police as Chris Harvin drives off. At this time, countless units from Riverside PD, Riverside Sheriff's Office, Corona PD, and the California Highway Patrol descend upon the pursuit. Costa Mesa Police Helicopter Eagle came across the incident as it was already flying in the air and radioed to the ground units. Hey, uh, you guys need some help down there? Oh, wait, that's right. Cross-agency communication barely existed back then. Pickup truck traveled northbound and was involved in two hit-and-run incidents, fired hundreds of rounds of ammunition toward police, injured 10 police officers, sent a patrol car crashing into a dairy farm, while also disabling a total of 33 patrol cars, 
And by disabling, I mean disintegrating, chucked IEDs and hand grenades at police on the freeway, injured a 12-year-old boy who was riding his bike minding his own business, who thankfully survived, and they even shot down the helicopter, Eagle, which was forced to land. The suspects made it all the way to the San Bernardino National Forest and continued on down a dirt road. Deputy Evans, a country boy who's keen to dirt roads, continues down the dirt road chasing these idiots while calling off on the radio as he's being shot at because he's a former Vietnam era Green Beret and a badass. We're moving, we're a quarter mile from the Ranger Station on Sierra Road in the National Forest. They're firing like crazy. Sergeant Bender and Detective Hopkins, undercover narcotics detectives of the Riverside County Sheriff's Office, were also in pursuit behind Deputy Evans in an unmarked unit. They had the only radio that could channel multiple agencies and were able to keep up good comms with other responding units, such as two other deputies who were responding from a substation nearby, armed with M16s. The suspects came to an abrupt stop at a dead end and quickly jumped out of the truck and set up an ambush. Deputy Evans made his way around the corner and entered a volley of gunfire. He immediately dropped his radio to cover behind his patrol car returning fire with his 38 revolver. As the two deputies arrived with the M16s, they very sadly and very unfortunately witnessed Deputy Evans fall to the ground after he was struck in the head by gunfire. The deputies light up the four suspects with the M16s, sending the suspects scattering in multiple directions into the wilderness. The next morning on May 10th, with the assistance of a 65-manned LAPD SWAT team, a massive manhunt took place searching for the suspects, who camped out by themselves in freezing temperatures overnight. Chris and Russell Harvin couldn't handle the hypothermia and surrendered without incident, and both idiots were bleeding out from gunshot wounds received probably by Deputy Evans the day prior. George Smith was spotted and was also bleeding out from multiple gunshot wounds and taken into custody without incident. Manny Delgado, on the other hand, was spotted by a police helicopter. A ground team cornered him demanding that he surrender, but Delgado opened fire and immediately got disconnected from the world. All three remaining men were found guilty of all 44 felonies, including the murder of Deputy James B. Evans. The Norco shootout played an influential role in the militarization of police and is still used today to train law enforcement personnel on counterterrorism and survival. There's a lot of really good lessons to learn from this incident. Always make a tactical approach. Actually train with your vehicle and know its areas and angles that give you the best cover. I really wish more academies stressed this one. Train with your fucking car. Also carry a tourniquet and a patrol rifle. As always, thank you for watching and dropping a thick like. If you're watching this after upload, come hang out. I'm streaming over at twitch.tv slash popomedic. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you in the next video. Hi, shiny.